Welcome to Around Kansas. I'm Deb Goodrich. And I'm Michelle Martin. And we are celebrating Buck O'Neill today. And any day is a great day to celebrate Buck O'Neill. In fact, I think we should just uh, start a deal. You know, what would Buck do? Because he was such <laughs> an amazing man and um, legendary baseball player, but just a legendary human being. And behind me is a photo of the Kansas City Monarchs, a Negro League team that um, that Buck played in and gained fame in back in the day. And Kansas City fell in love with him and and uh, loves him to this day. So uh, I I just love this picture, all those smiling faces, and um, it's such an incredible incredible history. And that's a gorgeous illustration you've got, Michelle. Yeah, I love this. Um, I love the way this artist played on the name Monarchs and we mm -hmm. see the Monarch butterfly, uh, you know, flying there uh, in the outfield and there's Buck reaching reaching to make an, a spectacular catch. And you're right, Deb, um, Buck O'Neill was an incredible human being. Um, I grew up in a baseball family. My brother uh, played little league and played. he played high school. And he was actually a really great pitcher. And um, so I grew up with baseball in my family. I grew up going to Cincinnati, where my mom's family was from, to see the Cincinnati Reds. And Joe Morgan, famous Cincinnati Red, member of the Big Red Machine that I got to see when I was a kid growing up, he actually said that he felt that Buck O'Neill was the greatest ambassador the Negro Leagues ever had and he said he also felt that Buck O'Neill was very similar to Jackie Robinson. Uh, he said there was more to him than just baseball. Oh, gosh, absolutely. Um, getting ready for this. And the reason we're talking about Buck is he is being inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. Um, long overdue, but... Um, very I, I long overdue. Buck complained. In fact, I was watching mm -mm. a video of his speech in 2006 when other black players were inducted into the Hall of Fame and, and he spoke on their behalf and oh my God, it's an incredible speech. But I was watching um, another video clip of Buck on the David Letterman show back in the day. And I think that it was when the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum opened and that was, or, or not long after, and that was kind of Buck's purpose for being there. And um, he's, nobody was more charming, funnier, just more enjoyable to watch than Buck O'Neill. And he talked about, uh, David Letterman asked him how old he was when he started playing. And Buck said 12. Well, David Letterman misunderstood and thought that he'd started playing professionally at 12. And he says, oh my goodness, that's incredible. And Buck said, well, my daddy played ball and you know, I played ball. I was, I was good with my hands. I caught the ball when the old guys threw it to me, you know, and, and um, so uh, Buck grew up in Florida and they kept talking and he said, and you played at Kansas City. Well, first I went to Memphis. So, and he played everywhere. He played in Memphis. Mm -hmm. He played in, uh, um, uh, oh gosh, Shreveport, I'm trying to remember some town in Louisiana that he played for. Um, and then, uh, um, it was the town in Louisiana that was a farm club for the Monarchs and they saw him play. So the whole time David Letterman is thinking that he's, you know, playing for, and he's like, and you're playing professionally, you know, when you're 12, how old were you? No, no, no. I started playing when I was 12. I was 23 when I started playing, <laughs> you know, professionally and, uh, Letterman's like, oh, no, I, I, you know, I got it all wrong. And Buck says, well, I wasn't that good, you know, to start playing professionally at 12, but I was good. And, and, and it was just awesome. So then, you know, like I said, he made history with the Monarchs. And, and he talked mm -hmm. about, too, um, whenever uh, professional ball clubs would come uh, visit Kansas City, you know, play the Royals that they would come and ask Buck to take them to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And so he had tremendous fun showing them around the museum and, and Letterman asked him, uh, well, you know, what, what do you, what's your job there? You know, what do you, you're like the director, what do you do? I'm chairman of the board. 
Just like, just like the chairman, Frank Sinatra. Yeah. The chairman, chairman, the chairman of the board. The chairman of the board. Oh my goodness. But um, the Negro Leagues had a tremendous ambassador, but so did baseball and so did Kansas City. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Buck, so beloved. I mean, just beloved. And he shared a great story about Jackie Robinson. And he was talking about uh, um, when they were, uh, you know, still segregated. And of course they played all over the world, or excuse me, all over the country. And, um, but they would go into a lot of towns where, you know, things were segregated. And he said, Jackie is the one who started doing things differently. And there was a um, gas station that they would pull into um, and this may again have been in Louisiana, but it was the Monarchs, you know, when Jackie Robinson was playing for the Monarchs and they weren't allowed to use the restroom. And so um, he said, we've been doing this for years. You know, we've been pulling in here for years. And he said, we pull in and we're getting, getting gas and Jackie gets off the bus and he's walking to the restroom. And um, the man said, uh, hey, boy, where are you going? He said, I'm going to the restroom. And he says, you know, you can't use that. He said, well, then you better take that nozzle out of the gas tank. And Buck said that man started thinking. He said, we had a 50-gallon tank on that side. And we had a 50-gallon tank on the other side. He ain't going to sell that much gas to one customer till we come back. And he's <laughs> like, all right. He says, y'all use the restroom. Don't stay too long, but y'all go use the restroom. And he said, and Jackie just started making these, making things different. Mm -hmm. ah, it was incredible, incredible. Well, you know, even though Buck himself never played in the majors, he breaks a barrier in the majors in 1962 because when he goes to the Chicago Cubs, he becomes the first African American yeah. coach in Major League Baseball yeah. history. Yeah. And one, and he had been working as a scout for the Cubs. And one of the things that you read about Buck O'Neill and you hear from other players time and time again is that he had an eye and an intuition yeah. for talent. Yeah. He could tell he it was not just a player's physical capabilities, but he could figure out which players had the mental toughness and the mental stick to mm -hmm. and sharpness to make it in the majors, yeah. because it is a difficult life. You are sure. on the road, yeah. you are traveling. And also, once the majors are integrated, he knew that African American players, and as we started to see Hispanic American players coming into the leagues, he knew they were still going to face in some cities a great deal of racism. Oh, sure. And that he was able, that he really served as um, a guide for these players. And he also helped educate white players about the issues that their fellow players of color faced yeah, and that he really in a very non-confrontational in a very um, warm-hearted a very good intentioned and very gentle way helped people on teams see the value of one another as human beings. And I think that's why Joe Morgan said there was more to him than just baseball. Oh, absolutely. Because, because when you're doing that with those players and you're helping them see one another as humans, not as African-American players and Hispanic players and white players, when you're getting them to see one another as baseball players who are talented, they see each other as human beings. Yeah. And those labels of race and of color, they don't ever go away, but the sharpness that was attached to them in that time period lessens. And that, you know, he was really so helpful um, in the locker room doing that. And then what that does, that creates ball players who leave the majors um, better equipped to deal with life in general. And so his lessons that were imparted went well beyond baseball. Absolutely. Well, we're just so thrilled that he is being inducted into the 
Baseball Hall of Fame, uh, remind you to visit the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in Kansas City and the Jazz Museum while you're there. Um, and the World War One and the World War One Museum and Mo National Monument. Yeah, which is too terribly far away from those museums. No. So um, yeah, so much and to do there. The Arabia. <laughs> oh, yeah, the Arabia. Yeah, we could. Folks, we could give you the most intensive uh, guide to uh, great museums to see and visit in Kansas City because I think we've been to them all, haven't we, Deb? <laughs> I believe so. I believe so. There's if you run into a, an issue and just run out of ideas, let us know and we can <laughs> we can help you out. So, once again, congratulations to Buck O'Neill. Kansas City is so proud of you, and we're all so proud and um, just. Uh, cherish your memory and the legacy that you left for us. So congratulations, Buck O'Neill. Yes, Buck, congratulations. It's long, long overdue and so richly and well-deserved. Absolutely, we'll be right back. Two hundred years of stories take more than a year to share. The Santa Fe Trail Bicentennial continues through 2025. Join us on this epic journey of exploration on America's most historic road. Find our podcast each week on truckersradiousa.com. Find us on Facebook. Find us at santafetrail.org. The Santa Fe Trail lives on. Welcome to the Western Kansas Wildlife Travel Center right here in my hometown of Oakley, Kansas. We're the front door of Western Kansas located on three main highways, I-70, US-83, and US-40. And all those roads lead to history, beautiful scenery, and adventure no matter which direction you go. We now have an IHOP brand that you've trusted up and down the road in all your travels is staffed with local folks, real people, just like you and me, and we're waiting on you to join us. So for fun, adventure, fuel up, fuel your body, and let's have some fun. So our good friend, Greg Rude, whose images we use so many times, has a new calendar uh, for Kansas. And since it's a new year, coming right up here, time to get a new calendar. So we uh, want to take a couple of minutes just to um, point you to Greg's um, Facebook page. It is, oh man, Rural, Rural Routes by Greg Rude, R-U-D. And, um, or just look up Greg on Facebook or message me or whatever, but um, he does some stunning images and he lives right around Wilson Lake. So many of them feature Wilson Lake and this one behind me, you know, it's not just the lake itself. It's beautiful, but that rugged country around the lake is just gorgeous. And some, and there's a let me see if I move the right way. Little deer walking down the road. Background. Yeah, Bambi in the road. And um, he uh, he just captures some, some gorgeous, gorgeous scenes. And Wilson Lake, um, as the photo behind Michelle indicates, is one of those places where people often say, this doesn't look like Kansas. Exactly, I know. When I first moved to Kansas, Deb, I lived in uh, Pittsburgh and then I moved up to Fort Scott. So I was used to that Eastern half of that Eastern portion of the state near the Missouri border and uh, that nice rolling green country. And then uh, the more I traveled Kansas, the more I discovered Kansas is definitely not flyover country. And she has one of the most diverse landscapes and the changes in ecosystem and wow incredible and so I had to use this photo behind me um, because I love to see uh, all of the uh, 
the beautiful rock formations that we have in Kansas. Mm -hmm. I know our, our good friend Ian, um, who, uh, who sometimes portrays Dr. Turner at uh, the Fort Wallace Museum. I know Ian loves our Kansas fossils as much as we do. And so actually when I saw this, I thought of him. So mm -hmm. thought of a great fossil adventure. Well, we thought we'd just give you a ride around Wilson Lake today. And this one we went back in the vaults for, back into the archives. And this is one that Frankie C. did back in the day. But you'll find Wilson Lake is just as stunning today as it was when Frankie was describing it. Uh, here we are again. It's Wednesday. And this is around Kansas, in case you just tuned in. Let's ask, uh, who are those people? So... Anyway, um, we got to get a billboard. That reminds me, Frank. I was thinking of that again when I was riding out I-70. And there's our friend Brent Harris from Dodge City, who's just all over the place. I talked to Brent on the phone the other day, but it's like, we need a billboard, we Frank. We need a billboard. We yeah. need a billboard. Big billboard. A yep. big billboard. That's yeah. right. A big billboard. <laughs> so anyway, um, you know, but the, this, this show really is about Kansas. And it's people and places and things to do and all of that. Around Kansas. And, and really, there are a lot of places to go in this state. Uh, and I'm going to get to do a story about one of those places. And you really should go there. It, it's an absolutely beautiful place. And it really is, well, what do we want to say, uh, diverse somewhat in its, in its uh, topography? It, and again, for all those folks that think Kansas is flat, and after watching the show for, you know, a month or two, I don't know how you could possibly still believe that. But this will put to rest forever about flat Kansas, won't yeah. it? Yes, it will. Well, and part of it is managed by Kansas Parks and Wildlife and the others by the Corps of Engineers mm -hmm. as well. And so it's both federal and Kansas managed. But nevertheless, there's all kinds of wildlife. There's all kinds of, uh, of, of recreational activity and all that. But I'm getting ahead of the story. And as you will see, it's a perfect place for photographers. Oh, yes. So the photographers, we're, we're just getting so many gorgeous photos from around the state. Share yours with us on our website, on the, um, our Facebook page around Kansas. Email them to us. But we love seeing the photographs that you take all over the state of these gorgeous places. Well, and we'll probably use a lot of Greg Rude's work in this particular story. Wonderful. Yes. Wonderful. We love you, Greg. You do amazing stuff. Whenever folks claim Kansas is flat, pull out one of Greg Rudd's photos of the jagged landscape surrounding Wilson Lake. It's one of those scenes that make the unknowing scratch their heads in disbelief, and it's only minutes north of Interstate 70 on the Post Rock Scenic Byway west of K-232. Located in the heart of the Smoky Hills, Wilson State Park is located in Russell County with a small arm extending into Lincoln County. The Saline River is both the reservoir's primary inflow in the west and the outflow to the east. Smaller tributaries include Elm Creek, which flows from the south into the western part of the reservoir, and Hell Creek, which feeds the reservoir's southeastern arm. The Corps of Engineers manages three parks at Wilson Lake, Lucas Park, Minooka Park, and Sylvan Park. Lucas Park is located on the north shore of the reservoir's eastern end and includes the Rocktown Natural Area. Minooka Park, named after the Oto word for good earth, lies on the south shore of the central part of the reservoir. Sylvan Park lies below Wilson Dam immediately northeast of the reservoir. Both Lucas Park and Minooka Park host swimming beaches and boat ramps. All three parks include hiking trails and camping facilities. The Corps of Engineers also operates a visitor center located below Wilson Dam near Sylvan Park. Considered by many to be the most beautiful in the state, Wilson Reservoir features a rugged shoreline punctuated by scenic cliffs and rocky outcrops. The park and surrounding wildlife area offer the opportunity to view and photograph deer, pheasant, waterfowl, songbirds, and fur bearers. Wilson Reservoir offers excellent white bass and striped bass angling. The Cedar Trail in the Oto area is, one, is a one-mile loop with a concrete surface and is great for a leisurely, low-stress walk. 
the 25.5 mile long switchgrass uh, bike trail, I'm sorry, that's the switchgrass bike trail, is popular with mountain bikers to pursue this challenging activity. The Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks operates Wilson State Park, located on the south shore of the reservoir's eastern end. The park is divided into two areas by the reservoir's southeastern arm, the Hell Creek area on the west side and the Oto area on the east side. The Hell Creek area hosts a marina. Both areas include hiking trails, swimming beaches, boat ramps, and camping facilities. Hunting is permitted on the public land around the reservoir, although it is restricted in certain areas. Wilson Wildlife Area is located on the upper end of the reservoir. The 8,000 plus acre public hunting area is made up of rugged rolling hills of native prairie cropland and riparian timber along the Saline River, Cedar Creek, Turkey Creek, and Elm Creek. The area has a waterfowl refuge that was established in 1996. It's Christmas in Lecompton, where thousands of antique, Victorian, and themed ornaments adorn 200 trees throughout the Territorial Capitol Museum. Open Wednesday through Sunday, the exhibit runs through January 1st. Spend the day and experience all this small town has to offer, both historic sites, shops, food, and wine. Merry Christmas from historic Lecompton. Howdy, I'm Seth Hayes and welcome to my hometown from then to now. Council Grove has a rich history as deep as the prairie tall grass. Spend the day visiting 25 historic sites or explore the unique shops and restaurants or mosey out of town along the Santa Fe Trail. You all visit my hometown, Council Grove, in the heart of the Flint Hills. Okay, looks like it's time for our tour. Welcome to the Fort Wallace Museum. Here at the museum, you're gonna find some really interesting stuff like our replica stagecoach from the Butterfield Overland Dispatch. We've got facades from the fort buildings. And we've got an 1870s flag. There's a plesiosaur that was discovered locally. We've got the Ray pump organ collection. We're a little bee place with a great big story and we'd love to have you. Well, welcome to downtown Lecompton. It looks like a nice sunny day in Lecompton and the leaves are all out. So obviously this was not taken this morning, but it's always nice in Lecompton, no matter what the weather is, isn't it, Michelle? It is. And this image behind me is actually the uh, front of Constitution Hall. And you can see there's some bunting and there are some people uh, up there on that little porch of, Lacan, of Constitution Hall. There was a little speechifying taking place that day uh, during territorial days. You know, there's a lot of speechifying goes on in Lecompton, isn't it? That may be the number one industry of Lecompton is speechifying from the days of, uh, you know, when people were railing against Jim Lane to now, people are still speechifying in Lecompton. And that's and now what you I tell you about. Well, and now you can go to you can go to Aunt Netters and have something to eat. You can go to Empty Nesters and have a few glasses of wine, and then you can really do some speechifying. Um, but yes, you know, Deb, as we are ending uh, the month of December here, we are getting ready to look forward to 2022, and with the start of a new year, it means the Bleeding Kansas Lecture Series in Lecompton. And are we excited? And Michelle and I are both former lecturers and that uh, august group of folks who have lectured in Lecompton. They're in the, the second floor of the building that's right behind Michelle. And it never fails to uh, impress me um, walking up those steps. And especially when you have the chance to speak, to think of all the incredible um, debates, um, mm -hmm. the all the people that came before and walked in that building that is one of the most historic buildings in Kansas and we're just yes. oh God, so grateful that it's been preserved and of course our friend Tim Ruiz has been the site administrator there from the word go and mm -hmm. um, we're uh, just 
love it, love it. And so we're very excited. And if you've never been to the um, lecture series that goes on for, is it six Sundays, Michelle? That uh, I, the last one in um, January six. and through the first in March. And mm -hmm. um, if you've never been, I really can't imagine that you haven't because it's always standing room only. They always pack the house. Um, they have even gone to putting um, closed circuit TV on the first floor um, for the overflow crowds. So, um, and, well, and I'm rare, I've been there with ice that thick and people are still, still full. I, mm -hmm. it's incredible. You would think they were playing basketball. I know, I know you would think that you, you would think it was Jayhawk basketball at Fog Allen Fieldhouse. Mm -hmm. um, but no, actually every, uh, this year, the series will begin on January 30th. And so it is a series of Sundays in January, February, going through the first week of March and Sunday afternoons. Tim uh, does a fantastic job uh, bringing together a wide variety of speakers. And they really talk about, um, it's a series of talks and in some cases, dramatic living history interpretations of the events that took place in territorial Kansas and during the Civil War period. So topics that range from 1854 to 1865 are fair game. Um, as we said, you've been a speaker there, Deb. I've spoken, I've done a mix of first person living history interpretation and I've done straightforward, um, you know, public friendly scholarly lectures. Um, I actually, my last in-person speaking engagement before everything really shut down with COVID was the Bleeding Kansas uh, lecture series um, in 2020. And I actually talked, I spoke about um, the movement of Muskogee Creek and um, other native people out of Indian territory up into Kansas under Abafo Yahola, um, known as the Trail of Blood on Ice. Um, the topics are fantastic. This year we've got um, um, on January 30th, Kansas Day at Spaces of the Free State House, the first General Assembly of the Territory of Kansas. And so they've got a special unveiling of a group portrait that identifies each member of the 1857 to 1858 Kansas House of Representatives. We've got people talking about um, Smokey Hill Thompson, President John Calhoun, uh, Order Number 11, which is infamous in the history of Bleeding Kansas. Um, we have one, The Life and Times of Ross Burns, Accidental Lynn County Pioneer and Civil War Hero, in the trial of Jefferson Davis and the issue of secession. So, I mean, it is got something for everyone and a wide range of topics. It really does. And if there's not enough room or if you're a nerd and your partner isn't, like I said, they can go spend time in the antique stores behind me and, <laughs> and uh, going to uh, uh, have a bite while uh, somebody else is listening to the lecture and uh, there, there's just something for everybody mm -hmm. but the lectures are always wonderful and the crowds are so good and and it's it's always a lively discussion the the Q&A afterwards is always mm -hmm. really good and um, you know they always have cookies and coffee and and um, we have to thank Charlene Winter Charlene Winter um, bakes amazing cookies. I can't partake because of uh, celiac disease, but before I knew I had it, that was one of the high points of going and uh, after, before and after the lecture, you could have a great cup of coffee, some of Charlene's homemade cookies. Um, but what's great, Deb, if you have a mobility issue and cannot get up the stairs because there is no elevator in the building because of its historic age, um, it is obviously grandfathered in, um, but what they do for ADA compliance, um, when you get in the first floor, they've got the large screen TV that's downstairs. They do that closed circuit downstairs and they give preferential seating to those who have mobility issues and can't make it up the stairs because they are pretty steep. And that is where folks will sit and then overflow. And um, when I was there uh, and spoke, 
Um, the last time I spoke in 2020, we had every seat upstairs was taken and downstairs was full as well. And it really was um, wonderful to see that many people there, um, to see the building packed, but to see people in LeCompton going into the antique store to Aunt Nutter's. The winery had not opened up yet. They were in the process, but gosh, um, Aunt Nutter's did great business that day. And they have wonderful food, folks. Um, it is fantastic going to LeCompton, have some lunch, visit um, Bald Eagle Mercantile, take a little stroll around town, go visit the Territorial Capital Museum. Um, do that before you come over to the Bleeding Kansas um, talk. But make sure that you get there early to get yourself a seat, put something on the seat to save it, because if you leave and there's nothing on that seat, that seat is fair game and it will be gone. It will, it will. And that's a testament to our friend Tim Ruiz and his hard work and our good friend Paul Bonmeyer and the work they do to promote the series. It is one of the longest running lecture series that takes place in Kansas and it is so well attended and it really is a testament to their hard work. And, I, and folks come from from all over, you know, from um, two hours away, people drive to to come to the series. And so, um, yeah, by all means, you better get there early that day. You just might as well plan on waking up in LeCompton and um, hanging out. And like you said, go to the Territorial Capital Museum and um, the trees will be down. The Christmas trees will be down by then. Mm -hmm. But there's still so many cool exhibits to see there. That, um, and take a little take a little drive also, you know, right there. Um, go to First Democratic Headquarters and walk around that area because it's up on that bluff and you can walk around the grounds there and look down toward the railroad track, but also toward the Caw River. Mm -hmm. And you can see the river. Um, that's really a fantastic spot. I love that spot. It's just a great place to walk. Um, and I like to walk and I kind of think, I close my eyes and just kind of stand there and think, listen and think about what it would have been like when the ferry was going back and forth um, to the other side of the Caw, to, uh, <laughs> to Rising Sun in the red light district. Um, you know, I just, I think about all the people that walked that area before us, uh, both native people and those first um, non-native settlers that came in during the territorial period. There's so much history, it's, it runs so deep there. And, and actually we've had people who come from Oklahoma and Nebraska to come to the series. Mm -hmm. So we get folks, you know, um, Northeast Oklahoma, you're looking at about a three, four hour drive. Uh, folks coming from parts of Nebraska, Kansas City, even over uh, from over in Missouri. So it is definitely something that needs to be on your must do list in the new year. So you can follow um, Historic Lecompton on Facebook and they post all kinds of things with their schedule and you can visit um, the, ter the, excuse me, Constitution Hall right behind Michelle is a state historic site. So you can also visit the State Historic Sites website and find that uh, building and information about it and just tell everybody when you get to LeCompton that Deb and Michelle sent you. Might get you in a little trouble, but oh well. Well, take bail we money. Just, exactly, take some bail money. Well, this has been a great day and um, our last show for this year Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, it'll be uh, great to see this year go in many ways. And um, like, uh, but on the other hand, my granny said, don't wish your life away. So, you know, take it as it comes. And I um, just want to thank you all for visiting with us, for bringing us into your homes and for sharing. Um, thanking our sponsors for keeping us on the air. We appreciate it so much. And as we've made this transition to digital, which is, you know, a whole new world. Um, mm -hmm. We really appreciate your staying with us, so. And you thanks. know, Deb, we should really give a, a special thanks to Heather and Elizabeth, who are our behind the scenes gurus who take the raw files and images and web links that we send them and they uh, 
you know, they sprinkle their production fairy dust on it and they make it into a show for us. Thank Lester. you to Heather and Elizabeth uh, for, for that behind the scenes work because without them, we would not have a, a finished product to share with you. And thank you to all of you for watching and for sharing uh, the show with your family and your friends and expats uh, who would like a slice of Kansas wherever they may be. So you all have a blessed new year and we will see you in the new year. Bye-bye. Happy new year. <laughs>